this webinar. My name is uh, Dr. Sahil Arrokin. I'm the president of Emerson Neurology Society and uh, at the same time, consultant neurologist from Rashid Hospital. Uh, it's our honor today to have a distinguished speaker from uh, Canada, Montreal. Uh, Professor Gauthier is a, a distinguished name in the field of uh, dementia and Alzheimer. Currently, he's the director of uh, Alzheimer and Related Disorder Research Unit at McGill University and Douglas uh, Hospital. Uh, he did his study at uh, Montreal University, where he proceeded with his uh, fellowship and uh, research uh, study at uh, uh, Allen Memorial Institute. It was an honor for Suhail to study at Allen Memorial. I had uh, three months to be uh, in that uh, hospital. Uh, Professor Gauthier uh, has uh, been uh, active in the research field of uh, uh, Alzheimer and uh, dementia and cognitive disorder. He had uh, a numerous number of publications. Just I was going to the, his number of publications, I couldn't count them. It's more than hundreds of publications. So honored to have you between us today, Professor. He's going to update us about uh, dementia update, what's coming in the pipeline, and uh, what the new in the dementia area. Prof, the stage is yours. Welcome uh, to Dubai. Shokan, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Let's see if I can uh, put the slides on for you. I'd like to, tell, uh, to, uh, to ask our uh, audience if they have any questions, they can direct it to, uh, through the chat uh, area down here uh, where you can put all your questions. And at the end, I will summarize all these questions to Professor Gauthier. Uh, you can start, Prof. Thank you. Can you please confirm you see the full slide? We see you now, Prof. Perfect. Yeah, uh, can you? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the discussion about uh, the management, uh, which is much more than just a prescription of uh, current medications. We will spend a bit of time on the troublesome behaviors because they're often the reason why families seek your advice. Um, depending where you live in the world, uh, some countries like North America, people may come alone when they have mild cognitive impairment, but many countries, it's the families that bring the person with dementia when behaviors become an issue. And whether you're a neurologist, psychiatrist, or internist, we all face the same difficult um, issues with managing behaviors. And then perhaps the most exciting part for most of you is the what's next. The clinical case is about a woman age 82. She is brought in uh, to your office with uh, her husband. Uh, the history, uh, in a nutshell, is gradual decline of her memory for recent events over three years. There are some false beliefs uh, that people are stealing her things, in particular her purse, which she keeps misplacing. And there's also some agitation in the evening when it gets dark uh, after 6 or 7 p.m. The uh, mini mental state examination is 15 out of 30. She is not overtly anxious and uh, she's uh, at least grade six educated. So that would be a relatively low score. Good general health for an 82 year old, small body weight and a head scan, uh, which is done between this first assessment and the next showing non-specific diffuse atrophy, no silent strokes. So what was done uh, between the first and the second visit uh, was to uh, try to manage the evening agitation with more light in the house. Um, and less noise from TV and the environment. Memantin was started at the second visit and titrated up to 15 milligram a day. We'll discuss later why that dose was selected. And eight months later, after she was relatively stable, she's brought back by her family because she's up at night, does not always recognize her husband, and is at times physically aggressive. And he's himself 80 some years, so there's concern about his safety. So what was attempted uh, for the agitation and the uh, not recognizing the, the husband at night was uh, an antidepressant. This is something uh, you perhaps don't hear often that uh, sedative antidepressants such as trazodone or mirtazapine can sometimes help enough that you don't need anything else. In her case, it didn't work. So risperidone had to be given in small doses uh, twice a day. Later, Months later, she fell in her bedroom, in her bedroom and uh, this was complicated by a hip fracture, which required hospitalization, and she died from aspiration pneumonia two months later. So this 
This is a relatively typical course um, of a few years uh, between onset of symptoms, uh, requiring assistance for behavior, and then complications leading to death. And this is also um, useful, this case, to highlight some points in the course of disease that are summarized here in this diagram, which you may find useful when you talk to families uh, about the course of disease. And um, it starts with um, the mood, uh, subtle mood anxiety changes before dementia is even suspected. This is now called minimal behavioral impairment, MBI. And this would precede the cognitive decline uh, in the MCI stage and would precede the functional impairment, which then would be the dementia stage. Then there is the relatively linear cognitive decline measured by the MMSC, the functional decline, and then the worst of the behavioral symptoms emerge later in the course of typical Alzheimer. If you have hallucinations too early, then you think of Lewy body dementia. If you have social disinhibition as the main problem very early on, then you think of frontal dementia or Alzheimer with frontal presentation. And you see that the behaviors such as agitation, aggressivity tend to peak and then improve with time. So whatever your management is, please reassess every three months if you still need the neuroleptic or whatever drug you're using. And the last stage for most people are gait impairment, Parkinson-like rigidity, uh, Gegenhalten rather than cogwheel and falls, and you die of aspiration pneumonia. So that's the full typical progression of symptoms over an average of uh, eight years for the typical patient with Alzheimer. We are discussing now for the next 10 minutes the management of dementia, but at the end, in the what's coming next, we'll talk about managing mild behavioral, mild cognitive symptoms, MCI, and try to anticipate what is coming soon uh, for asymptomatic people who do have Alzheimer pathology. So now focusing on dementia management. Okay, disclosing the diagnosis is uh, tricky. If you have someone who is depressed, you cannot say they have dementia or Alzheimer, obviously, because they may have enough awareness that it could lead to suicidal ideation or gestures. But some family member must be told that you suspect dementia because uh, some decisions have to be made early about work, about driving, about uh, finances. Um, the family may not ask you a lot at the first visit, but they may at the second, and you need to have some kind of um, referral to Alzheimer's Society or some support structure so they can get more information about the disease. You cannot tell everything at the first or second visit. There's just so much information to share. Financial planning is important. Uh, the person with dementia may be the leader of the family. They may be the one who has to sign on checks and so on. So there has to be provision made for a power of attorney. And uh, in some countries, what is called a personne de confiance, somebody you trust to make decisions for your health. So sometimes it's different people when you trust for finances, when you trust for medical decisions. Safety of driving can be an issue depending where they live and safety at home if you live alone. In uh, Canada, half the women with dementia live alone at home because they're a widow or, uh, or uh, divorced. Uh, so safety at home becomes an issue early on in some cases and you need to have uh, visits done at home by uh, staff uh, such as occupational therapists or social workers from the community. The health of the caregiver is also something we have to be concerned about. The elderly spouse can have his or her own uh, health issues and if they spend so much time at home with the person with dementia, it may be time away for them to go to other activities or see their own physicians. Most specialists like us uh, don't usually treat the caregiver. Uh, we're not family doctors, but we need to be sure that the caregiver has uh, time for, the care, for, for access to the, uh, care, the, his or her um, primary care practitioner. Concomitant disease, um, depending on your style of practice, if you're an internist, you may want to handle the anticoagulants, the diabetic medications. Most of us do not. We use the family doctor and other health professionals. And then finally, the symptomatic drugs, which we'll discuss uh, now. Uh, next slide is about concomitant diseases. Just some highlights that recently came out. Next slide, please. We did a survey of um, uh, new evidence that um, 
first of all, prevention of stroke is good for the brain and it prevents dementia to some degree. This is actually something you can put as a health policy in your country. Preventing stroke is a way to prevent dementia. What's pretty new is that the, audition, the reduction in audition, partial deafness, and reduction in vision are also conductive to early dementia by impaired uh, sensory neural uh, communications. Uh, depression is often there uh, at the beginning of the disease when people still have awareness, uh, still insight, and it should be looked for and treated. Uh, sleep apnea is very common, uh, at least in North America, and uh, it's worth asking about it, and perhaps do a screen with an oximetry overnight in people where you suspect sleep apnea, because it is a contributing factor for progression from MCI to dementia or worsening of dementia. And preventing of, prevention of falls is, uh, as we saw in the case, important, because if you fall, you break a leg, you usually don't go back home, or you lose a lot of your residual autonomy. So... Now we're going to move to the symptomatic drugs. Next slide, please. So there's four classes that can be discussed today. The cholinesterase inhibitors, we will review the highlights. Uh, they've been around for some years, so we're at ease with them. The NMDA receptor antagonists, such as memantin, is perhaps less familiar, but it is uh, uh, very much used uh, uh, now in North America for some time. Antidepressants may be underused uh, by some of us because um, there's not a lot of uh, level one evidence against placebo that there is a big effect on depression in dementia. But the fact is in uh, low to medium range doses, uh, SSRIs such as Valnefaxin or uh, citalopram in the morning can help a mild depression. And uh, in the evening, as I said already, trazodone, mirtazepin, slightly sedative antidepressants can help uh, some evening or uh, nighttime behaviors. And antipsychotics, we don't like them, but sometimes we have to use them if there's no other way. Uh, Risperidone is the one we use the most as neurologists in Canada. Uh, Olanzapine is liked by psychiatrists as a sedative antipsychotic at night. Uh, ketypin is often used by family doctors because it's simple sedation, uh, but ketypin is the one with the least level one evidence for benefit against placebo, and it increased the risk of falls quite significantly. Uh, next slide. So moving on now to cholesterase inhibitors. Uh, we're going back now 25 years. Um, there was a belief at one time that there was a group of uh, large uh, cholinergic cell bodies at the base of the brain hence the name nucleus basalis of Maynard, that could have been um, an, et an etiologic factor in Alzheimer, a bit like substantia nigra in Parkinson. It didn't pan out to be the case, but for a while we thought maybe if we inject replacement cells, cholinergic cells, some kind of stel stem cell strategy, cholinergic reinnervation, it didn't work out. But what's important uh, is the fact that these uh, cell bodies inner innervate most of the neocortex. And the pathways are well worked out anatomically. And if you show the next slide, you will see on the left, in orange, the anatomical tracks from the nucleus basalis to the neocortex. And you see on the right, a case of mixed Alzheimer and vascular dementia with a lot of white matter changes indicated by the red arrows. So it's uh, logical to think that the vascular patchy lesions do interfere with the cholinergic ascending pathways. And this is um, my argument to say, if you see someone with dementia with vascular features, you, can, you could still try a cholinergic uh, agonics uh, or a cholinergic enhancing drugs because the uh, vascular lesions may have interfered with the cholinergic innervation. Next slide, please. So now moving to the uh, mematin mode of action. Uh, so the first class of drug, cholinesterase inhibitors, relatively straightforward. They increase acetylcholine uh, content uh, in the synapse uh, by inhibition of the breakdown enzymes. The three uh, cholinesterase inhibitors are roughly equal in terms of efficacy. They're slightly different in terms of side effect profile, which we can discuss in the Q&A if you wish. Mematin works in a completely different way. It's a partial uh, blocker of glutamate receptors. And this is an illustration that was created by Paul Francis in the UK that I think illustrates best how it works. If you can click twice on the slide, 
So we can see the three synapses. Once more, thank you, I'll leave it there. So what you see illustrated is the fact that the um, relative excess of glutamate activity is interfering with uh, the action potential getting through. And on the right, you see the memantin effect on glutamate receptors and the action potential is actually getting through. So that's one way to understand the uh, action of uh, memantin on glutamate receptors. And it, to, to be effective, it seems to need a relative excess of glutamate activity. And maybe that's why memantin does not work much, if at all, in MCI or early dementia, more in moderate to severe dementia, when there is this relative excess of glutamate activity. Uh, next slide. So this is one of the early studies done in the US by Reisberg et al. Uh, in people with moderate to severe dementia, Alzheimer type, where you have six months of treatment. In the bottom arrow, you see the decline on the uh, cognitive scale. And in white on the top, you see the uh, cognitive uh, effect of memantin. Next slide. Now combination therapy. So this is another study done in the US uh, where they had uh, people moderate to severe dementia, Alzheimer type, who were already taking donepezil for at least six months, and they get added on, they get memantin added on or a placebo. So the top uh, the black lines are memantin with donepezil, and the lower lines are the ones on, on donepezil plus placebo. And you see on the left the effect on cognition, so improvement above baseline with the particular tool that was used here, the severe impairment battery. And on the right, you see the functional effect, which is delay of loss of residual function. These were, these were the two studies that led to the FDA approval of Mimantin in the US and in Canada and most countries. Next slide. Many of you uh, will ask, what about combination? Uh, the evidence is uh, equivocal. There was one attempt in the UK to combine donepezil and memantin in a well-designed factorial four by four study. And um, the results are equivocal because they didn't have enough patients to actually uh, do the full statistical analysis. Uh, I'll show you the results next slide. That, that, that picture is worth a thousand words. So what you see on the left, is the MMSC decline in people with moderate to severe dementia, Alzheimer type, who were still at home. Most of them were on donepezil before the study. And then they were randomized to go back on donepezil or go on memantin or go on both or stay on placebo for one year. Needless to say, you couldn't do that study anymore because of the ethical consideration of placebo for one year in symptomatic dementia. But what you see is uh, on the bottom, again, look at the left panel. The lower line is the MMSC decline, which is the worst on placebo, no doubt. And then on the top, you have the three uh, dotted lines that are converging, same results at one year. So you're better than placebo after one year in moderate to severe dementia, whether you're on memantin or donepezil or both. They were not able to prove that the combination is better than either drug alone. Okay. And on the right, if you're interested, this is the Bristol ADL. So the top line is the worsening of uh, functional autonomy, which is worse on placebo. And same efficacy for the other three drug treatment arms. Next, please. There's one uh, observation study uh, worth noting. It was done in Pittsburgh. So these are people uh, not in research, not randomized, real patients who were uh, followed in one clinic by Dr. Lopez. And you see the time it takes to get to a nursing home, which is in the US and to some degree Canada, a proxy for severe dementia. So what you see in, the, in black, the lowest line, is the time it takes to a nursing home if you're on placebo. No, sorry, take that away. If you're on no cholesterol inhibitor, nor memantin, there's no placebo here. That's important. So you're good, you, you have to go to a nursing home earlier if you're not on any drug treatment. The red line is those who are on one cholinesterase inhibitor, whichever one. So they're better off than no drug. Careful here. It may mean that if you're taking a cholinesterase inhibitor, you're better cared for. Somebody's uh, built to afford the pill for you. You're seeing the doctor more often because somebody has to monitor the treatment. So there may be a bias there. 
And then the green on the very top is those who are the least likely to go to nursing home in the observation period, or those on combination, mematin and aconistase inhibitor. Perhaps because they can afford it, because they have uh, better family pressure for treatment. You understand the bias. But nevertheless, it's an important observation and uh, it should be co considered when you explain to families, um, look, there's two kinds of drugs available. We start with one or the other, and um, the combination may be better than one, either one alone, but we're not sure. Okay, we can talk about that in the QA. Next slide, please. Now, side effects, and this slide will lead to um, you answering a survey. So this is time to be interactive. So with 15 years of experience with cholesterase inhibitors, please select one of these side effects for the one most commonly encountered in clinical practice. So now they will launch the um, survey. You click on which is you think the most common so we can click on the numbers. And click, and, and now I think most people have voted. Almost uh, still we have more people. Still it's, people uh, voting. Voting, it's 20 minutes. So you can click from number one to six. What? So we have uh, 30 minutes more. I think that's enough. I don't think yeah. it's going to change. We, we can okay. give them, uh, 20 seconds more. Okay, that's fine. Okay. okay, I think that's fine. So people have voted nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which is based on the... Um, I just need my slides back. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So now I'll comment. Uh, next slide will show you the answer, actually. The most common answer. Next slide. The next slide, please. Yeah, it's the rhinorrhea, the nose running. And it's common enough, you have to tell people because they may think they're allergic to something and they end up on Benadryl. The other um, things that you voted for, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, are the classic ones. But people are careful not to give cholinesis inhibitors high doses in people who are frail because they're more likely to have these side effects. Also, if you give um, the cholinesis inhibitor with a food, you get less of the nausea, vomiting. Uh, these are reversible and those related side effects that people have learned to, 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 to handle. Bradycardia is uh, not usually causing symptoms that people complain about. If you have a syncope on denepezil, uh, it's because you had a pre-existing heart problem and you need a pacemaker anyway. Leg cramps are uh, due to nicotinic stimulation uh, and uh, they're handled by changing denepezil in the evening to the morning. Most people, that's all you need to do. The insomnia and REM behavior disorder was a surprise when the Nepazil first came out 15 years ago, and, um, and we now know the mechanism. Um, it's sometimes seen in people who have a Lewy body subtle disease, um, and it's handled by changing the schedule to morning instead of evening or adding clonazepam at bedtime. And decreased appetite and weight, there's a debate about whether it has to do with Alzheimer itself or it has to do with the drugs uh, geriatricians often uh, will um, not use cholinesterase inhibitors or stop them if uh, it's an elderly person uh, who's losing weight. Uh, and in some countries like France, they actually withdrew reimbursement of cholinesterase inhibitors because the geriatrician or um, family doctors with geriatric interest uh, worried more about uh, the appetite and weight than the apparent benefit. Now let's compare that with uh, memantin. If we can now switch to the next slide. So these are the side effects. Uh, the first line is not really a side effect. It's just a reminder that memantin is excreted by the kidneys. So please select between confusion, constipation, visual hallucinations, and increased appetite and weight among these four. Which one you think is the most common? Don't select excreted by the kidneys. It's not a side effect. It's just a, a mechanism that you have to rem remember when you select the dose. So I see people voting for confusion, constipation, second. Visual hallucinations are there. Uh, 
Okay. All these are uh, a side effect, isn't it, Prof? We, yeah. So you're looking for the most... Uh, the most common in, cl in clinical practice. Okay. So maybe we can stop now and I'll comment. And so confusion you select as the most common. So I see you've had experience with that medicine. At the high dose, certainly that's the case. So I'll comment on that. Now, if you show the next slide to show which is, in my experience, the most common. Next slide, please. Okay, so constipation actually is the most common. And uh, elderly people are more prone to constipation to start with. Um, and contusion agitation, which um, is paradoxical because that maybe one reason why you're using mematin in the first place is really those related. So if uh, you follow the recipe we will discuss in a minute, um, you, you, may not, you may not encounter that so often. Um, you can also tell the family, look, if you have a improvement of agitation, then it gets a little worse as you increase the dose, just go back to the previous dose. Uh, visual hallucinations are extremely rare with mematin. If you have visual hallucinations, they may have been pre-existing as part of a Lewy body uh, concomitant dementia. Uh, visual hallucinations, on the other hand, can occur abruptly with a single dose of memantin. It's uh, spectacular and very rare. And finally, increased appetite and weight is common enough that we sort of tease people about it, hide the cookies. Um, it's a good uh, side effect to have in people who are frail, actually. And that may be one reason why you select mematin over cholesterol inhibitors. It's the uh, frailty and low body weight. The uh, mematin may be good for them in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Okay, next topic, uh, which we will do, uh, just the uh, high view, is uh, therapeutic options when dealing with troublesome behaviors. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, as we said already with the uh, early diagram showing the natural history of Alzheimer, you remember that first hump of mood change? Well, this was already picked up by observational uh, studies in the US. Uh, Dr. Grossberg here published in the 90s. As you see, a scatter of uh, common behavioral symptoms. Before time zero, the time of dementia, before time zero, there was already some evidence that depression was there, um, paranoia, etc. So this was the ancestor to what we call now mild behavioral impairment. But you see that the worst behaviors are later than the diagnosis of dementia in typical Alzheimer. So uh, agitation, aggressivity uh, are usually three years later than the onset of a cognitive decline. The next slide, please. So how do you measure behavior? You use the neuropsychiatric inventory. So we'll briefly mention that scale because it's going to be used in the results of studies we're going to discuss now. The surprise for many people is that apathy is the most common behavioral symptom in Alzheimer's. Apathy, uh, mean withdrawal of interest, uh, reduce socialization. They're more quiet and they lose the initiative. And uh, it's less troublesome than other behaviors, like agitation and aberrant motor behavior, wandering at night, etc. So uh, this is a checklist that's been developed by a neurologist, Dr. Cummings, and it's used in most clinical trials now uh, around the world. Next slide. Please. So in general, when you deal with a behavioral symptom, whether it's urgent, somebody calls you from the hospital, a doctor prescribes something now because he's restless or whatever, you need to take a pause and say, what is the main symptom causing problems with the staff or with the family or the patient? Make sure there's a medical evaluation if it's an abrupt change, because it could be a delirium a urinary tract infection, early pneumonia, many other pain, chronic pain can trigger behavioral changes. So try to modify the aggravating factors. So whether it's the neighbor, uh, next room, uh, the 
somebody moved in the house and creating difficulties. Uh, if there's a change in the environment that may have triggered the behavior, you can fix that. Now, education has been shown by uh, careful studies done in the UK that uh, if, you can, if you educate the family and the staff about um, behaviors, what they mean, how to handle them, you, re you reduce the need for psychotropic drugs by 50%, 50%. So education is key if you want to manage behaviors in a hospital or a nursing home or at home. And medications should be used with caution, as we will discuss now. Next slide, please. So one study that uh, was done with the NPI, the checklist by Dr. Cummings we mentioned already, um, with galantamine, five months in mild dementia, Alzheimer type, showed a surprise. So you see in the lower line, the white line, emerging behaviors over five months, mild behaviors in mild dementia, but the flat lines are no change, no new behaviors emerging on galantamine. And this was not followed up by anybody later. Next slide. This was with Donepezil. So this is a study that was done in the U Canada, uh, Australia, and France. Moderate to severe dementia, Alzheimer type, at home, not in nursing home. And this is Donepezil versus placebo for six months. Again, again, you could not do this study anymore because of ethics. But the surprise was that the yellow line on the top is improvement in behavior just being on Donepezil. Okay, uh, what is driving that difference is apathy, reversal of apathy, which is picked up by the NPI scale. The white line at the bottom shows relatively stable behaviors. Well, it's because during the six months you have access to nurse, doctors, you can try an antidepressant if needed, you can try escaping behaviors. But it was a big effect, and um, this has led in states to the use of Donepezil de novo in severe dementia, and guess what happened? Uh, the reversal of apathy was perceived by some of the staff as agitation, and the poor patient who's actually better had to go on the tranquilizer. So this is a, perhaps a practical lesson for us. If you, you, if you use symptomatic drugs for dementia, make sure there's a good reason, uh, a, a good target symptom, and the right time to, to use these drugs. In other words, if you're doing well uh, overall at, in severe dementia in your routine, maybe you don't need to go on the drug like Donepezil. Uh, next slide. In terms of mimantin, so this is a summary of six studies, uh, and you see on the left the, the data points uh, um, using the uh, NPI 12. So two more items were added to the uh, checklist we just looked at and they show a improvement compared to placebo. But what is actually improving is maybe more important than the number. But please, next slide. Uh, what is actually driving the difference is uh, improvement in ag agitation and aggressivity. And we're not sure why. There's no uh, specific pharmacologic reason why agitation in particular would be improved with mematin, but it was picked up by this uh, uh, scale. It was also picked up in the adverse event table. And uh, it was obviously uh, in the adverse events, if you have placebo for six months versus memantin on six months, if you're on placebo, you're twice likely to have agitation than on memantin. And this was confirmed by the analysis of the NPI scale. Uh, next slide. So that was one study. Now, if you pull all six studies with memantin, you find the same thing. Um, next slide. If you now look at um, if the symptoms were present at baseline, do they get better? So agitation, aggressivity does. And next slide. If you don't have the behaviors at the start over six months, what happens? Well, you have less emergence of some behaviors, including agitation, aggressivity. So Practically speaking, it means if you see someone with the mild agitation, if you start on memantin, they may not improve a lot, but they, you may prevent worsening of the agitation over at least six months. That's the message. And next slide. So why would you use memantin as first choice? Uh, well, if it's um, someone at the moderate stage, like our patient, uh, emerging agitation, or somebody old where you're afraid of the side effects of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, as you are pointed out, or losing more weight. 
And I did not mention that yet, but there is an unexplained effect of memantine on speech in, the, in progressive aphasia, aphasia post-stroke, and Alzheimer with prominent verbal impairment, sometimes memantine will improve the language. We have no physiologic explanation for this, but it's just something to remember if you need to choose a drug in a specific patient. The next slide. Combination. So as I try to illustrate from the uh, study done in the UK called the Mino study, there's no hard proof that the combination is better than either conexin inhibitors or memantin. But in someone who has a good tolerance to a therapeutic dose of a conexin inhibitor, whether it's donepezil 10, rivastigmine 12, galantamine 24, and there's still the, there's a clinical decline. So one option would be to add memantin. Of course, if there's side effects from the conexin inhibitor, you can switch to another one or switch to memantin. In um, some parts of the world where the reimbursement is um, important for the use of the drugs, uh, like where I live, um, the government will pay for the two classes of drugs for at least one month of overlap. And that's important as also as a practical message for us. If you're on a high dose of a conexin inhibitor and you go off the drug abruptly because you, now you're starting memantin, what may happen is there's a washout effect a withdrawal effect of the cholesterol inhibitor, which can be bad, uh, especially behaviorally, while you're increasing memantin. So it may look like memantin is bad. No, it's because you stopped the other drug too, or too quickly. So if you are switching to memantin, you need to have at least one month overlap between the two classes of drugs. And that's been recognized even where I practice. They pay for the two classes of drugs for at least one month overlap. Okay, next one. We're nearly done with this. Uh, titrations, yes. So that's important because the memantin is sometimes underused in terms of dose because you're afraid of confusion. But before age 85, uh, 20 milligram is usually no problem. Uh, 85 to 90, 82, 89, 15 is the average dose, and over 90, 10 milligram, simply because of renal function, average re renal function at these age groups. Uh, the titration is uh, the classic one from Austria where the drug was created 40 years ago, five milligram added per week up to uh, 20 milligram or 15, if you select 15, and that takes a month. So that's why you need to continue the cholesterol inhibitor during that month, unless there, is, uh, there are side effects from the cholesterol inhibitors that you need to, to, to treat quickly. Next one. Now what to expect in the near future, and then we can have our Q&A. So next one. So we've discussed so far management of dementia. Now we'll start to have a peek at what could we do in the mild cognitive impairment stage. This is a period of uh, three to five years. It's not present in everyone, but it's common enough that there's a whole literature about it. And uh, the availability of uh, treatments that may be useful early into the MCI stage may bring to you new, a new clientele of people in their 60s and 70s who have uh, mild complaints, mild impairment, who may have now the option of uh, the new drugs. And then later on, maybe in five years, we'll have um, specific treatments for people who are asymptomatic, no symptoms, but have the amyloid and tau pathology. Next, please. So to discuss the uh, new drugs, we need to consider the uh, classic uh, pathologic cascade. So the amyloid first, no argument. It's 20 to 30 years before dementia, no argument. This has been documented in patients with Down syndrome. They have it since birth, essentially. In people with familial autosomal dominant dementia, uh, PS1 mutations in particular, the amyloid buildup is very early in their life. And if you study uh, late onset sporadic Alzheimer at over age 65, and there's ways to look back in cohorts of people yeah, the amyloid pathology, it builds up slowly over 20, 30 years. Uh, then there is a, an inflammatory response. We're not sure what triggers it. It could be systemic going into your brain, or it could be triggered in the brain by mechanisms still unknown. It's not easy to measure, but it's there. And then there is the tau pathology, within, which is uh, mostly intraneuronal, but there may be also some 
uh, tau fibrils at, outside the neurons. Um, you need both to say someone has Alzheimer's. But even if you have both alp myeloid and tau pathology, you may have no symptoms. You probably need a third factor, which could be inflammation, could be small strokes, it could be having um, pa Parkinson pathology, same nuclein pathology, as well as amyloid and tau. And that's probably why uh, the monotherapy of amyloid is not so far very fruitful, at least at the dementia stage. If you correct only one factor, it, not be, it may not be sufficient to modify the course of disease. So we're very close to now combination treatments to test anti-tau, anti-amyloid combined or anti-inflammatory, anti-tau combined. But how do we know you need that rather than one or the other uh, drugs? So let's see if we have biomarkers to guide us. Next slide. So this is the classic illustration uh, for the past 10 years where you have uh, uh, biomarker changes over time uh, before symptoms on the left. So you have the amyloid buildup. And then in the middle, the um, vertical lines indicate MCI. So you have uh, everything going up over three to five years. And at the dementia stage, everything is abnormal. The surprise we find is um, not everyone has everything, even at the dementia stage. I'll show you a case in a second. Now, these uh, various biomarkers require uh, PET scans, MRI, lumbar puncture. Can we simplify this somehow with a blood test? So the good news is maybe. So we're getting to that. Next, what, next slide, please. So ATN is the new uh, biologic definition of Alzheimer. If you want to publish uh, in big journals like Brain, uh, you need to have data on your poor patients. Do they have amyloid in the brain, tau, and neurodegeneration? And currently, this requires PET scans, MRI, lumbar puncture. Next, please. This is one case from a cohort uh, we have at McGill, a patient with typical Alzheimer dementia, um, and he has no amyloid in his brain. The top scan, you see no, no red color anywhere, no amyloid. Whereas the middle scan is tau. So you see, especially on the left uh, middle panel, uh, a lot of red, that's uh, tau in the uh, temporal lobes. And you see a little bit on the right middle panel, the uh, frontal. Uh, Cortex. So it's a tau predominant dementia. It's one person in 10 that we see what we think have Alzheimer. Go figure. So if you dilute uh, the, this pool of patients in a clinical trial, you treat everyone with anti amyloid drugs, and one in 10 does not have amyloid, it's hard to find a therapeutic benefit. So the new clinical trials now all have a requirement that you have to have amyloid positivity before you go anti, on anti-amyloid drugs, which makes sense. Uh, next slide, okay. So the, um, the good news is there's, there's near convergence uh, that, of opinion that uh, the plasma P-tau, phosphotau, small peptides um, may reflect what's going on in the brain. And we're still working out which one is the best, 181, 217, whatever. It's being sorted out now. But we may have a blood marker that will tell us um, if you have amyloid and tau in your brain. And that will be a way to speed up uh, screening for people towards a clinical trial. And if we have a drug that's approved for anti-amyloid treatment, if they're positive on the blood test, you may not need to do a lumbar puncture or a PET scan for amyloid. There's another marker in the blood that's uh, been shown to be useful for neurodegeneration, and that's the uh, neurofilament light protein marker, but it's not a specific one, not specific for Alzheimer's. And next slide. Now the drugs. So uh, aducanumab is the one you hear the most about. It's uh, actually being reviewed by the FDA now. It's a monoclonal antibody. This would require IV infusions. Uh, monitoring for aria, that is brain swelling and hemorrhage, uh, you would need serial MRIs to do that. Um, I don't know if it will be approved in the US based on the two phase three studies, but one of these drugs eventually is going to make it. And uh, as neurologists, we will have to dis decide if it's uh, worth giving for how long. I predict three years, perhaps maximum use from MCI to early dementia. 
Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to delay the progression. Uh, and can we measure that delay in clinical practice? So one thing for sure is um, as neurologists, you will be asked to monitor for safety, interpret the MRIs, decide should I stop the next dose or stop treatment. So this is something uh, new um, and um, it will be interesting times indeed. Next slide. Other drugs being tested. So there's another um, antibody uh, being tested in phase three by ESI called BAN2401. So it's a similar kind of medication, monoclonal antibody, tags onto a different part of the amyloid protein. And uh, about 2% gets into your brain from your blood into your brain, 2 to 3%. And uh, the same kind of monitoring will be required. There is uh, another kind of medication being tried, oral agent, this time a P tau aggregation blocker. It's called LMTM. It's an uh, old medicine, um, better known as methylen blue, the dye. And it's being tested now uh, as a monotherapy in early Alzheimer's disease. And the final one that uh, is exciting, of, it, of some interest, it's an old drug that was discovered in Montreal of all places. Uh, 15 years ago, it was tested, but before we did all this amyloid pre-randomization test, and um, it's oral, it does uh, prevent the aggregation of fibrils, amyloid fibrils, and it will be retested uh, starting next year worldwide, because looking at the old data, it looks like those who were APOE44 carriers, homozygous, with mild Alzheimer, really improved with that medication against placebo over 18 months. So there'll be another go at this, uh, but only if you're double four. So this may actually um, change our practice in our clinics to actually screen for uh, uh, POE, uh, which we don't do routinely now, because those who would be double four would be more eligible for clinical trials, and eventually perhaps they are the ones we should treat with anti amyloid treatments preferentially. Uh, next. and the conclusions. And we will leave those up during the Q&A, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So um, we can already help people with dementia and their family with a global management approach. So it's not just a prescription as we I tried to illustrate this, uh, other considerations. Uh, we need to involve the families and the social network. There are new treatments that are coming. We've been saying that for 10 years, but it's true. <laughs> and they will uh, drive people to seek earlier diagnosis. That will affect your practice. It's already affecting ours here in uh, Montreal. And um, the final one was, uh, yes, it will be a new challenge for um, neurologists, but very exciting times indeed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Professor Gauthier for the excellent review and update uh, about uh, how to manage Alzheimer's disease early sign and late sign of Alzheimer, uh, uh, medication for the amnesia and for the antipsychotic and behavioral disorder. Uh, this is something uh, we are looking to have more in the Middle East and in UAE as many of our patients, families, they are waiting for a treatment. As you said, I remember when uh, I was in Canada, uh, all the team were speaking about these anti-amyloid, anti-tau medication, uh, monoclonal antibodies, and everyone said, so here, less than 10 years, we'll have multiple of these medications. Unfortunately, nothing come, came till now. And just a couple, uh, two days back, uh, one of the mo uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, trial has been announced, uh, phase two, uh, two trial evaluation of map is early an early stage of Alzheimer's disease anti-tau medication didn't, didn't meet the uh, primary efficacy endpoint or two of the secondary endpoints. So that medication is out also. Uh, we have plenty of questions and we have a good time to discuss and I will encourage all the audience, if you have any questions, please send that. Question number one, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, how about all these uh, uh, medication that is used in, in, in the market? So we have many things in the Middle East that the people are using vitamin E, Q enzyme Q, uh, uh, vitamin C, multivitamins, uh, uh, calcium. Uh, th there's, there's the Kingo Biolin and the coconut any evidence of using these supplements in Alzheimer patients? 
Well, there's no uh, level one evidence against placebo um, in the kind of studies we just discussed. So in the absence of such studies, we cannot say whether they're bad or good. It's kind of equivocal. So as long as they're harmless, but I would caution you not to over, not to treat high dose of anything. It's like folic acid. If you give too much in an elderly person, you can cause a bit of delirium. So too much of a good thing can be toxic. Same with wine. Oh. Uh, but, but we have s some clinical trials that they did with vitamin E and uh, Q, uh, Q enzyme Q10, which showed that there's no efficacy in these uh, uh, trials. Is that correct? Vitamin E, I know uh, for a fact, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, very high dose can be toxic. So okay. it's the same principle, don't treat um, with anything that's above physiologic range. Excellent. Another question, how about hormonal therapy, estrogen and testosterone? Where estrogen uh, supplements were thought about, uh, but this was uh, stopped uh, 15, 20 years ago abruptly when um, a 10-year study in women, um, was, it was shown that the primarin uh, versus placebo, the primarin group was more likely to get dementia. And that pretty much killed all the hormone supplements in that field. <laughs> We have a question from Monica Kadam. She's asking, uh, uh, at what age we need to start screening family members for Alzheimer patient? Is this screening is needed in non-Alzheimer family or in a family with a father or mother who had Alzheimer and they, after their age of 65? It's a very good question. And uh, people are asking this more and more. Uh, the screening should really be at the uh, family medicine level um, in the past year, as, as your memory played tricks on you and did it affect your daily life? If it's a yes, then you should screen with a tool such as the MMSC or the MOCA. But the, the, the usual so-called screen is really asking once a year to everyone over 65, has there been a change in your memory in the past year and does it affect your daily life? Full yeah. stop. How about stem cell? Just we had a question about stem cell in uh, Alzheimer. We, as I was hinting earlier, the nucleus basalis of Maynard's story was interesting because it suggested that maybe you can somehow inject cholinergic stem cells, uh, but um, the, the lesions um, are more distal. They're in the neocortex, and um, it, it's uh, hard to imagine how you could um, recreate the networks uh, of pathways that um, are lost over 20 years. Um, it, Alzheimer's is very much considered as a network condition now. Um, in very sophisticated uh, fMRI studies, people are realizing there are different networks. And um, this may explain the resilience, why you may have in over 90, people over 90, I'm a little bit in tau pathology, but they're still functioning well. Uh, in the routine, uh, it may be because the network is compensating somehow. It's switching from one network to another. So where would you put the stem cells? So there's a conceptual issue here. This is different from Parkinson, where you have a do, you do have a network uh, that is relatively small and the nigro striatal pathway. You could conceivably have the re replacement cells in the nigra or in the striatum, whereas Alzheimer, it's all over the cup. Uh, a question just came, when to start using the antipsychotic or antidepressant medication in Alzheimer's patients? Okay, the antidepressants are often used at the time of diagnosis when you're not sure if it's depression or dementia. So always use an antidepressant first and reassess after three months minimum. Uh, you may find over age 65, new onset depression with social withdrawal is an early manifestation of Alzheimer. But time, it takes time to see that. It may take one or two years for the dementia to be obvious. The antipsychotics are reserved uh, because of their side effect in older people with dementia. They're reserved for uh, specific symptoms that are not amenable to other treatments, whether it's environmental change, education, or anti antidepressants. So uh, ideally, you never use antidepressants, antipsychotics. But the, the, the fact is that... Um, in probably 50% of patients at some point in the course of disease, there will be some behavior that will require a low dose of risperidone or similar drug. Please reassess after three months uh, if you still need it or six months. And hopefully you can stop after six months, especially if you start memantine at the time 
when you start the, or, or soon after the time you start the Risperidone. In other words, if you have behaviors that are troublesome enough that they come to see you, um, and they're bad enough that you, you cannot wait for an antidepressant to work in three weeks, you need an antipsychotic right away. Okay, uh, maybe you, you need to reassess after three weeks, four weeks, and then you start the Mimantin, which may be adequate, and you can stop the antipsychotic later. Uh, I have a few questions about uh, uh, dementia with other uh, neurological disorder. For example, Parkinson patients with dementia, uh, uh, is the management are still the same using the uh, same medication for a Parkinson patient who start to have a dementia or a de de dementia in Parkinson patients is different type? Okay. Well, there's two kinds of uh, Parkinson kind of dementia. There's the Lewy body classic one where you have uh, the, um, the condition declining first with visual hallucinations and some fluctuations from day to day or half day to half day. Um, the Parkinson motor features are later. And the, these people respond dramatically well to cholinesterase inhibitors. They're the kinds of people with MMSCs that can improve five points, which you never see in regular Alzheimer. And then you have the Parkinson dementia, where someone has Parkinson, classic Parkinson with rigidity, a bradykinesia, and or tremor um, for at least three or four years, and then they have uh, cognitive decline. These are the people that respond to rivastigmine in particular. I think rivastigmine has the best data. And uh, if you have the patch as an option, it's easier to handle. They may have trouble swallowing pills. But uh, also they do improve the Parkinson dementia patients who has dementia is also can improve dramatically in terms of awareness, attention, and the family is very thankful if you do try a rivastigmine-like drug. Clear. Uh, th there's a question regarding the vascular dementia. I know that Professor uh, Hechinski, uh, Vladimir from uh, London, Ontario, he's doing a lot of vascular dementia business. Uh, is these medication can help vascular dementia and the overlap between Alzheimer and vascular dementia? Indeed. So this is uh, an important issue. Indeed, uh, most people over age 85 have mixed pathology, and there's some vascular component to most people with dementia over age 85, practically speaking. I tried to illustrate with the uh, slide use showing the nucleus basalis uh, innervation to the cortex and the patchy white matter lesions that you have uh, interference with these cholinergic ascending pathways as an argument for you trying a cholesterol inhibitor, even in vascular or mixed dementia. And the drug that has historically the best data is galantamine. For uh, historical reasons, galantamine versus placebo uh, showed over six months a very big effect in the mixed Alzheimer and vascular patients. A bigger effect than in uh, Alzheimer against placebo. Interesting. Uh, there's a question from uh, Mesa where she's asking what the drug of choice for dementia, for uh, renal impairment, other than memantine? Rivastigmine. Rivastigmine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, especially okay. if you can use the patch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just I'm going through the questions. There's uh, tens of questions there. Uh, acupuncture on dementia and Alzheimer, any evidence? Um, nothing. Um, major like level one uh, it's a bit like acupuncture in general maybe there's a short-lived effect especially for um, pain uh, there remember that many people many older people also have chronic arthritis and uh, that, that can feed on the, uh, con the, the, con the the cognitive impairment and the behavior so yeah if you can modulate the pain with acupuncture maybe indirectly you help the cognition and behavior yes uh, at, the la uh, 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 at the last few slides of your presentation, Prof, you spoke about the biomarkers. Is there any evidence of using these serum or CSF biomarkers in routine practice? Currently, uh, the CSF is used by some neurologists. Uh, if you have a young patient, so 50 to 65, with uh, early dementia and there's an issue of differential diagnosis, uh, some countries uh, like Mine, we use uh, the uh, glucose PET scan a lot as a first uh, step. And if it's equivocal, then it would be the lumbar puncture looking at amyloid and tau. Excellent, excellent. There is a question regarding if you have a strong family history of Alzheimer's disease, 
what can you do to avoid uh, as long as possible? Uh, this is important. This is a public health issue indeed. And it's true whether you have family history uh, or not. Uh, preventing stroke, uh, control of vascular risk factors in general, that's metabolic syndrome essentially, prevention, um, increasing your physical activity, especially after you retire, and your uh, social engagement. It's all common sense, but uh, you need discipline to do it every day. Okay, that's okay. true for everyone. Now, one thing that may change in the next three, five years is uh, clinics where you assess individual risks, especially if you have a family history. APOE4 would be the first thing to look for. So 15% of people uh, in the population have one copy of E4 and 3% have two copies. Um, the 3% may have a special interest for clinical research now, as I mentioned, one drug just for them. But in the future, uh, it may be part of a, a routine assessment that you will do when you're 60 to assess your risk of dementia 10, 15 years later. Clear. Uh, does the chronic cardiovascular disease increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease or dementia in general? The dementia, for sure. That's been yeah. shown by Dr. Ashinsky's work, as you were saying. And that's uh, amenable to preventive treatment. So if you work in a stroke clinic, you should do a baseline uh, cognitive assessment, maybe the MOCA, which is actually quite good for that population. And then um, th there have been studies done uh, showing that if you are strict about preventing strokes, uh, TIAs, um, perhaps reducing uh, emergence of new white matter lesions over time, you, you reduce the risk of dementia. Clear, clear, clear. Uh, let me to ask you, Prof, if a patient is coming to your clinic uh, with his family complaining of uh, starting forgetting he's above age of 70 and the fa family noticed that he became uh, isolated and uh, he's uh, having problem with his short memory, w uh, what five step you start to do for this patient? So this, I'm a neurologist, so if I was a GP, perhaps I would do something different, would be more systemic search for comorbidities, et cetera. So people have yeah. already done that. Yeah. So as a neurologist, I would uh, uh, dig more into the history, do a baseline MMSC MOCA, um, frontal assessment battery, uh, Boston naming, and um, get a CT scan or MRI. It's easier to get a CT where I work. And um, at 70, it's relatively young. Um, I would probably order at the next visit if there's still persisting symptoms and persisting impairment on the MMSC and or MOCA, I would do a glucose scan. And if I have a profile uh, suggestive of early Alzheimer, like posterior cingulum hypometabolism and posterior uh, parietal or temporal, often asymmetric hypometabolism, and then um, you, you have the option uh, to go into research where you get amyloid and tau scans. Okay. Or a lumbar puncture, more commonly available worldwide for amyloid and tau. 70-year-old, it's worth it. 90-year-old is a different story. So if you're 90-year-old, uh, your likelihood to have amyloid positivity is like 100%. So, but a 70-year-old, it's not. Okay. Uh, very clear. Just I'm going through uh, a list of questions. Many of these questions has been answered. Uh, antipsychotic education, uh, risk factor, how to prevent getting Alzheimer, uh, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetic with Alzheimer, CSF uh, screening tools. There's one just question came, are diabetic patients high risk? We answer this one. Full control uh, blood sugar, that has been answered also. Uh, uh, there's a question about epileptic patients on a long-term medication. Can he develop an Alzheimer disease? Yes, like everybody else. Okay, so there's I no. Would, I would reverse the question. Can you get epilepsy when you have Alzheimer? Yes, yeah. it's not common, and it's easy to treat. Okay. So, okay, got it. And it's one of the differential diagnoses: non-convulsive status and confusion, which is. Uh, which is there. I had one patient's prof who's uh, 80 plus having a sign of Alzheimer treated. He's known with the Parkinson. He start to have a, a tactile hallucination where he start to feel animals uh, and insect uh, crawling, uh, crawling on his limbs. Uh, 
is these a part of Alzheimer, these type of tactile hallucination, or it could be no. something else? No, this is not something you hear in Alzheimer or Lewy body dementia. You, okay. Maybe exceptionally in Lewy body dementia, you do get tactile, but most of them already have visual hallucinations, the classic ones. And if you will say, if I will say my patient is a blind patient, is a blind. Since a long time? Uh, he's blind now for the last, he has a macular degeneration. So okay. uh, almost more than three years, he's a yeah. blind. And he start to have these symptoms. I, I really don't know, but... Um, very very interesting. Uh, his daughter just called me today asking for that question. Um, so, that allows so, me to say something useful. Uh, the PET glucose scan, if you suspect Lewy body dementia as a cause of the hallucinations, whatever type, as a very specific sign that the neuroradiologist will look for. It's called the cingulate island. So okay. there is a, a patch of hypometabolism in the, uh, uh, the, the visual cortex that you don't see in Alzheimer in DLB. I agree. Last question, if I will say, because we have three minutes more, time running very fast. Would memantine be recommended for a young patient with post-stroke dementia? Uh, post-stroke dementia, young patient, that sounds like Cadacil or some... No, it's, it, it's, uh, we have here in Dubai, I'm a, a, a stroke neurologist. We are seeing people in their age of 50 and 60 and they're getting a cardioembolic stroke or other type of stroke. So it's not Cadacil who have a stroke, then he start to, 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 to forget and to have a sign of short memory problem. Is it depression or dementia that need to be evaluated? Well, the depression, as you say, you, you would uh, treat that first. Uh, there is some literature on uh, vascular dementia uh, with uh, most of the conditions inhibitors and memantine. It's not strong evidence uh, for benefit against placebo. The main reason is the tools to measure efficacy were the same as Alzheimer. And, and the vascular uh, impairment and the cognition impairment in vascular is, is different. It's more executive than memory, etc. So the short answer to your question would be it's worth a try, but not for a whole year. Just okay. try for three months. Agreed. Uh, one question more at the end came from Dr. Sarmad. Uh, Post-traumatic brain injury and dementia? Well, there's the and risk factor. If you're a football no, player with... No, no, multiple as, a, as a treatment, post-traumatic brain injury, is it a football, is it car accident or wrestling? And uh, patients start to have a dementia. Uh, a memantine or uh, uh, donazepil, is it working in these patients? I don't think there's enough data to answer that. It would be case by case, short, start, for short therapeutic trials. Clear, clear, clear. Uh, at the end, we reached here Dubai time 10.15. Uh, I'm uh, so happy and uh, pleased to have uh, um, uh, an international figure in that area of dementia, Alzheimer, and aging. Uh, so pleased to have you from Montreal, Prof. Uh, Prof. Uh, Gothner has been tonight with us in Dubai, in UAE, updating us with a recent trial update in dementia. Uh, I would like to say thank you. We had an excellent number of attendees. I will ask you to stay in the room. And uh, we will go to the main room just uh, for uh, uh, wrap up. Thanks for everyone and have a great night. Stay online, uh, please, Prof. So you can join the other room, Prof. Prof. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.